I'd like to thank uh, Richard and the other organisers for inviting me again here. It is great to be back, although it, it's a bit strange to be back talking about the same things that uh, we talked about, as, as Bob mentioned, a long time ago. Um, and I will apologise because um, I have to leave after lunch today. Poling Tan and I are, are both on the newly formed Science Advisory Panel for the Murray-Darling Basin um, Authority, and so uh, they next big meeting is starting tomorrow in Canberra so we have to do a bit of a runner for that and, and start listening to all the real problems that, that happen if you allow sort of development to go unchecked for a long period of time. So that's a, another interesting task that we've got to deal with tomorrow. But Richard asked me to talk about waterholes and uh, I, I wanted to start by saying that my first visit to the Lake Air Basin was in fact the workshop on the Cooper Creek in 1996 and I, I remember getting a, a very formal letter from uh, Dr Bob Morris who I, who I assume was the local GP of the, <laughs> um, as you know quite 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 uh, not the local J, um, GP but um, but and, and JP for that matter but I guess the, the the point I wanted to make is that um, you know my introduction to the Lake Air Basin was through that process and then through forming uh, friendships with a number of people who are in this room and some that are not and, and in particular uh, Angus and, and Bob and, and Sandy Kidd who, who we spent quite a long time working on their properties and sort of introduced us to the channel country and allowed us uh, and supported us in all the work that we did and it's a, it's a bit of a shame in some ways that Sandy's not here as well to, to enjoy so I think he'd have a few things to say as well. Um, so I guess you know, I, I, over that period of time, our group has spent a lot of time doing research on water holes and, and, and a big focus on how water holes work as sort of ecological systems. And so we've had groups of projects and students and people coming out here for the last 15 or so years working on various aspects of fish and their ecology and, um, and, and where they get their sources of energy. Um, we found some really interesting things, I thought, when we first started here. These are incredibly turbid systems, but they, they seem to be driven by um, uh, what we call the bathtub ring of algae, which grew along the edge. And so when you actually do use chemical traces and, and do the sums, you can find out that most of the biomass, most of the fish and crayfish and everything in there are actually deriving all their energy from those sources. And so they're sustained. Uh, by those um, sources in there and about you know 70 to 80 percent of the total biomass the things that are living in there are supported by that and that was a really curious feature at the time um, as I said these are the sort of sources ultimately that that sustain all the little creatures and the fish that Adam and others have talked about right up into the turtles you can trace that sort of signature right through that and that seems to be a really key feature of these systems that they're internally supported in, um, in that way. In the last seven or eight years, we've moved a lot of our research even further north, and I've been involved in a number of projects now ranging across the north from the, the Fitzroy and the northwest of WA and in the Douglas Daly system and in Kakadu and the Northern Territory and, and up into some of the rivers in the Gulf. And, and in those systems, again, if you go and study the water holes there, this, it's the same story. These are incredibly important systems. They're where things take refuge during the dry periods um, and they're sustained by the same um, algal sources. Those, those same principles apply from the, the sort of work that we'd, we'd started in the Cooper. Very, very similar sort of um, conditions apply. And the one key distinction, I guess, is that when you're working in those sort of systems, most of your work um, you do from a, a great distance from the water's edge. The, one of the nice things you sort of realise about working in the Channel Country rivers is you can actually get in and swim around without getting eaten. And, uh, <laughs> and so it's a real contrast to actually do try and do some of the same work in, in Northern Australia. But importantly, again, the same sort of story. Waterholes are really a, a critical place for these things to hang out during dry periods. And they, um, you know, the, the quality of the water and the sources of energy that drive them are really sustained uh, by having, you know, sort of high quality um, systems and, and not disturbed. Um, we've heard in a number of um, talks already just how important floods are. And we have to acknowledge that water holes aren't the whole story to the channel country in these river systems. Uh, they are certainly a key part of the story, but, but floods are also really important. That's where um, populations of fish and other animals get their real boom and their real opportunity to reproduce and grow and expand and so the flood times of course are incredibly important and we've had the opportunity to study some of those um, over the last 15 years or so 
and we know it's those that really generate that enormous boom of production. If you do the sums on how much production goes on in a single flood event and compare that to what would happen in a waterhole, there's you know, years and years of production happen during a single flood that ultimately um, are helping sustain those populations during the dry. But the key point, I guess, well, I want to raise is that, you know, it, of course, it's a long time between drinks between those big floods. And it, so it, it comes down to why the waterholes and why the um, uh, maintaining, protecting waterholes is really, really important, particularly for things that depend on them, the, the aquatic things, because it can be a long time between drinks. And certainly, uh, you know, if you look at the historic record for the Cooper, I think the longest spell on record was 21 months in the, in the 50s, and that's in, you know, European recorded history. Um, it's probably there have been some longer spells than that. I think this record goes back to, what is it, 1940s, I think it was the Curra Riva gauge for the Cooper. But certainly there are these very, very long dry spells, and waterholes then become this very critical resource because they are really the only place that aquatic animals can hang out, particularly things that live for a long time. So, and if you don't have wings and you, you can't move around uh, from, from waterhole to waterhole, then you're really quite stuck, and these become uh, really important places. Um, of course, they're also important for all the other things that live in the basin as well, and I include not only the other terrestrial uh, fauna, the water birds and, and uh, other birds and, and the terrestrial animals, but also, of course, the, the people who, uh, you know, make their livings uh, uh, working and living in the basin as well. These are incredibly important uh, refugia as well during those dry times. There's, I know, been a lot of contention about how many of these are there in the basin. This is from a report uh, from 2009, um, mapping of waterholes in the basin. And really, a lot of this comes down to what do you define as permanent. Um, I think the definition they used was whether or not things have been dry since white settlement. Um, this particular mapping exercise says there's about 830 permanent, semi-permanent waterholes throughout the basin of, of about 30% of those have, have never been... Have been uh, uh, never been dry since white settlement. And most of those, of course, occur in the Cooper, uh, which uh, by all accounts is about 80% of the permanent water holes. Um, and there's only, according to this particular one, 60 truly permanent water holes in the Georgina Diamantina. And most of those, are, the other ones, are, are classed as annually dry. I, I guess the key point, rather than argue about how many there really, really are um, and which ones are named or not, it's, I guess the key point is that 830 even is not a very large number for a, a river basin that's a million plus square kilometres. And so when we're talking at a couple of hundred of them that are only uh, been permanent in white settlement, that's not a very large number for a, a, a river system and a key thing to remember. So the key thing is that the, these waterholes persist um, over those long periods. Um, there are long periods without any local rainfall or any local uh, discharge. These are systems that experience a very, very high evaporation rate. Um, they're two to three metres of pan evaporation in the catchments. A lot of these water holes are you know, less than two metres deep. So you, know, you do the sums, they're not going to last for very long. And, and in fact, the, the fact that many of them last longer than a year is quite remarkable. I think as uh, Bob has already uh, mentioned. And by and large, they're sustained by surface flow. And certainly the ones that we've looked at in the, in the uh, Cooper, uh, in the Channel Country systems, all of their water is derived from surface flow. There are a few exceptions of bank sort of storage during flood events. And there are, I know in the lower Cooper, there are places where you do see groundwater connecting to the surface water. But by and large, these are like swimming pools. They're just topped up by surface flow and they're not going to be sustained by um, any other groundwater inputs, and we've we've done some work in the Cooper to show that. So we know then that you know the really big floods are going to connect all those water holes, and, and they these big floods happen very infrequently. Um, uh, floods of the size of the 1990 and the 2001 will go out and fill all of the water holes. We know that after that we could say that all of those water holes are fill and a lot of them then will slowly start to evaporate away if, once they become disconnected. And so if you look at, say for example, a section of the natural flow regime in the Cooper, once we get out uh, to discharges that bring the, the river system out onto the floodplain, we have these pulses, these booms of floodplain production. And so you can get quite large events that sustain water on the floodplains 
give rise to that sort of boom of production, but they're only very, very infrequent. And those flood pulses we know are really important. Uh, we know we have these extended dry periods of time. And during the dry periods of time, what we see there are the water holes are contracting and they become really quite productive in their own right. And we've certainly uh, got a lot of information to say how, how important those periods are and, and what are the key factors that, that sustain those. And in the between, between the big events that get out onto the floodplain and between the dry periods where the, the water holes are effectively isolated, there are, of course, these smaller events. And these flow pulses, if you analyse them, there's usually quite a lot of those during the, the flow record. Um, you know, that period there from 1939, the, there were 197 flow pulses between that uh, start to flow to uh, getting to the point where they break out onto the floodplain. And they last, you know, three quarters of them will last for five days, but some of them will uh, go for much longer than that. But the key point is that there are these smaller flow events and they're really quite important because these are the things, of course, that are topping up those little buckets of water all along the way. And they become quite critical in between the big events at sustaining uh, those surface water, uh, uh, water bodies. So what happens then when we talk about flow interception, and I deliberately term this as flow interception, not wanting to distinguish in, in any way between whether you're taking the water out for irrigation or you're taking it out for mining, because the key issue here is about taking water out of the system, irrespective of whether it's for mining or for, for irrigation. But, you know, you could, with reasonably sized um, interception activity, actually have, a, have an impact on the, the modest flo the flood events. And we've seen that in places like the Condamine Belong, where significant floodplain diversion and extraction can actually take the tops off very large flow events. And that will influence the scale of those big inundation events and, and will it will influence the duration of, of some of those moderate floods. So there's no question that larger scale activity or lots of small scale activity could affect the, 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 uh, the bigger floods. But one thing that is really certain is that small scale development, um, and particularly it's not just one small scale development, it's often lots of them, so I don't know whether you call uh, that large scale development on a small scale, but um, Small scale developments are going to affect the frequency and the magnitude and the duration of those flow pulse events. And that's one thing I think you can take as a certainty in, in, in a lot of the small scale development. It's the, it's the small flows, those flow pulses that are going to be hit the most. And we've seen that even in, in a lot of the harvesting activity that happens in parts of the Upper Darling and the Condamine Balon. It's the, it's the big impacts are usually on these uh, flow, the flow pulses, not the big events. And one consequence of that, of course, is it's not only taking out the frequency uh, at which they're occurring, but it also opens up the opportunity to increase the dry spell duration. And if you have a look at that piece of uh, flow record there, I mean, you can imagine that last little flow pulse that came down there, that little uh, event in between 1952 and 1953. If that was intercepted and taken out, that dry spell then would have gone on for several years and all of the water holes would have been dry. So you only need one of these events to be intercepted at the wrong time and the permanent water holes, the refugia that we're seeing, are gone and all the things that depend on them are also gone as well. So what that means then, once you start increasing these dry spells for more than two years, certainly there are very, very few water holes in the system that will persist for more than two years. And as they become less um, uh, prevalent um, and they become more concentrated, the pressure on those becomes more concentrated as well. And we've seen that in extreme drought, just what pressure there is, in this case by feral animals, on um, some of the uh, water holes as well. So what are the consequences of that? Then, well, certainly what we'll see is localised extinction of the fully aquatic stuff. So things that depend on the water are all going to die locally. Um, and if that happens on a, a wide enough scale, then they'll, um, extinction will, of course, occur on a, on a much grander scale than that. One of the less sort of uh, known aspects of it is that you, you start to lose connectivity and that starts to pose constraints on recolonisation. So the whole way in which, you know, Adam described of how fish and everything are recolonising areas once they get wetted up, there's a limitation to how you can do that. You've got to come from some sort of population base and it has to be of a certain size. And so one question around reducing the number of these permanent water holes is that 
you may not end up with enough to sustain populations and allow them to do those big expansions when it happens. And so that does threaten viability of these things at the basin scale. Look, the final thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, people know this is a highly variable uh, climate, but, and, and you may not all believe it, but it is a changing climate as well. And certainly the evidence here um, is for all of Australia is, is generally a pattern of warmer and drier and we and really the I mean I've been working with the International Panel of Climate Change fifth assessment which is going on right now one of the things the IPCC and you could criticize them for all the things they've done in the past but one thing to really take note of is they they consistently underestimate the rate of change of climate so they they're consistently underestimating the rate of temperature rise. And it's because it's a very, very conservative process that they go through. So projections that we're seeing for Australia and for the rest of the world is that it's probably going to be even warmer than people have been modelling to date um, and probably going to be drier and more variable than people have been modelling to date. And the predictions for this, this part of the world are a, a little bit hard to... Uh, to get your hand around. This report I think was done in 2007, so based on some of the earlier climate projections. Key things th that it's, uh, that it's uh, found is that you know, evaporation will increase in this part of the world and they do flag at top point there. Uh, that does have uh, implications for uh, refugia. Occasional irregular flows will become more important to sustain them, so it emphasises those flow pulses. Um, the low flows, the low daily flows, uh, the frequency of those is going to be reduced. Um, and again, they flag that that could be associated with reduced waterhole persistence and connectivity and extended periods of no flow. So again, the projections there that you could see periods of no flow extending out to 27 months based on that particular set of modelling. Uh, and that would be associated with waterholes drying right down to uh, less than 10% of their volumes, which we, we'd argue was quite a critical part. Um, and the bottom point there I wanted to make is, that, of course, all of those projections assume that there will be no further abstraction from those waterholes, so there's no additional take along the way. We've been doing, as one of uh, what my colleagues in, in the Institute, Doug Ward, has been doing some work at a national scale trying to map climate projections on perenniality across the, the continent. And this is looking at what proportion of water bodies can be classed as perennial uh, and, and this is an exercise that you can map at, at, at the satellite scale if you like. So these are based on perenniality in a five kilometre grid. It's just basically looking at what proportion of the water holes in any five kilometre grid are likely to be uh, perennial and perennial defined as that they'll have water in them uh, for nine years out of ten. So this is a, a, a bit of a different definition. <coughs> Um, but the map here, and this, he's pulled out a map for me for the Lake Air Basin, I don't know how well that comes out, but what it basically shows is the, the yellowish looking dots along the, um, and I don't know if I can show you here, but the yellowish dots basically um, throughout the Diamantina through here and through the Cooper, um, the, the model at the moment predicts little or no change based on that perenniality for that part of the world, but what you do see throughout this part of the basin, particularly the southern basin and the western part of the basin, the predictions are that that's going to increasingly become more and more ephemeral. So the, the, you're going to lose a lot of your perennial systems. And this again is based on some of the, the more current climate forecasting. That's taking it out to 2085, so it's not uh, too far down in the future. Um, so the climate is changing. Um, that will impact on the uh, permanence of the perenniality of these water holes and it's something to be taking to, to mind when we're talking about some of these new developments. So just to cap up then, the critic just wanted to finish with what the, the critical roles of uh, water holes as refugia. I think we have to acknowledge that there are a finite number, a limited number of those water holes in the system. Look, we don't have to argue about their importance, their importance to aquatic biodiversity, but their importance to communities as well. Um, we know that interception of surface flow is without a question the most significant threat to their persistence. We know that if you interfere with that, that, that that's going to have a big effect. We know that climate predictions to the region also indicate a threat uh, to waterhole permanence. And if you were going to bet hedge about a changing climate or a future climate, one of the best adaptation responses you, you could have is to minimise the risk by not allowing further 
take from the water holes that are here. So in the face of a changing climate, um, you'd be well advised to minimise the risk, not make it worse. And on that, I thank you all and happy to answer any questions.